I want to welcome everyone to uh, this very interesting session where we will present to you our innovator in residence. Three years ago, the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism started a conversation about the centrality of innovation to communication and to journalism. Collectively, our faculty, our staff, and students agreed to make sustainable innovation, not just one-off innovation, but sustainable innovation, a cornerstone of Annenberg's central mission. Fortunately, our parents joined this conversation as well, and thanks to their generosity, we launched the Annenberg Innovator in Residence program last year. The goal is to invite someone who is an innovator in his or her own right to help our community here at the Annenberg School specifically, more broadly uh, the University of Southern California and beyond that, uh, people who are in the neighborhood of uh, Southern California, uh, to come together and think about what innovation means in the context of their personal and professional lives. At our faculty's recommendation, we invited someone this year who is not only an innovator, but who has given careful thought to what innovation means for humanity and for society at large. Uh, one of my colleagues came up yesterday and said, well, this guy seems to be criticizing the central role of technology and innovation, and isn't that what we're supposed to be about? And uh, he was not upset, but he found it interesting and challenging. And what struck me is that's exactly the kind of countercurrent that we want to hear. When all the innovations, or what much of the commentary says, we need to innovate this way, we need more computers, we need more software, then the notion of sustainable innovation is, well, let's question that. Let's not take that for granted. Let's really get down to the basic epistemological and fundamental questions of what we think we take for granted. And for that purpose, um, Jerron Lanier is absolutely uh, the best person uh, to come help us with that. Uh, he makes a very sharp critique in this book. I'm going to wave this around and urge all of you to buy hundreds of copies, <laughs> even though it's molecules and atoms. Um, uh, and what, what's great about the critique, is, as many of you know, is that it's a, cre a critique from inside that community and culture. Um, Mr. Lanier has been involved with the development of software and hardware over decades. He is the inventor uh, and, and originator of, of the term uh, virtual reality and has been working with some of the leading people in, in Silicon Valley over the years. Um, in 2010, this is pretty cool, Time Magazine named him as one of the hundred most influential people in the entire world. That's pretty, that's not bad. Um, I mean, not just in the Bay Area, right, but in the whole world. I have no influence in the Bay Area. No influence. <laughs> Except for the Bay Area. Yeah. Right? I have total control of Los Angeles. Right, well, that's good, that's good. We'll, we'll talk later about that. That's great. Um, but everybody in the Bay Area believes that they do. So. Well, that, right, right. Yeah. Good, good realism. Um, He's been called a Renaissance man. It's also pretty cool. Some of you may not know he has a stamp named after him, or a, a country in the Pacific uh, has named a stamp af after him. But perhaps even more interesting, he's a musician, he's a composer, he's a pianist, he plays on specialized instruments, um, and he, he's, he really is a modern Renaissance man. And so we really are delighted that he has taken time out of his very busy schedule. Uh, to come and be with us. I, I'm going to put in one more plug, which I think this Sunday, New York Times Magazine section. Is it this Sunday? Um, I think, yeah, it should be this weekend's uh, okay. Times Magazine. Okay, so look at uh, Sunday, New York Times Magazine section. We'll have an article um, by Jerron. And uh, for those of you who read The Economist, there was a very interesting two or three page description of, of the man and his work in the London Economist. And so I urge that you to take a look at that as well. So without further ado, Jerron. Hey. So um, I, I was thinking about this comment that somebody thought I was um, anti-tech in some way. And um, let me tell you how I perceive um, this moment 
broadly speaking, in intellectual life. Um, a great many people are succumbing to a very natural fallacy that plagues the human brain, which is that the world can be understood in terms of uh, duels in opposition, uh, in terms of dichotomies. And so um, there's the idea that there was a less technological way of doing things, which might be putting up books on paper, and then there's a new way of doing things that involves more technology, um, and if one doesn't like the particular design of the new thing, then one must be anti-tech and promoting the old ways. And in fact, I'm doing no such thing at all. I'm a, uh, my primary job uh, is as a technologist, and I'm a fully devoted one, and I'm a profoundly nerdy, geeky, optimistic, techno-utopian, without apology. Um, and anyone who says differently is looking for a fight. Uh, and uh, and I, uh, I, I, I love working with gadgets. I just don't think you're one of them. All right? and, and, so <laughs> and I think being clear that you're not one of them um, helps clarify my job in making gadgets. Um, in particular, I mean, like, um, one I'm excited about is coming out soon. It's called Connect, a 3D camera for Xbox. It'll be out for Christmas. Take a look at that. It's a fun thing. And so, I mean, I love this stuff. And I'll promote technology all day long. And I'll work on it even longer. Um, but, uh, you know, <coughs> I want to draw an uh, analogy. And I, I, um, I, I hope this is taken in, in the right spirit. Because I don't want it to sound too ungenerous. But when I was a student... Um, in the 70s, uh, there, were, there, there was another opposition that was uh, a sense of duality that just dominated campus debates. And it was based on, uh, and it still dominates a lot of our politics, which was the left-right debate, the Marxists versus the capitalists. And there was this, uh, there were a whole lot of uh, people in the faculties of uh, liberal arts places at the time who were very devoted Marxists of one sort or another. And of course, um, the Marxists divided themselves by endless schisms. And oh my, they see there, people remember it, and it elicits a chuckle, right? And for some of you who are younger, you're probably wondering, what the, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, but uh, it was a big deal, believe me. And the thing is that that sense of opposition was so strong, and the people who were on the Marxist side of the fence believed that they were the new ones, who were the, the rebels against the corrupt old ways, and that they were the, the future, they were the, young, they were the young, innovative, creative, new future. So if you disagreed with them about something, they said, oh, well, then you're one of those old folks. You say, no, 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 I'm, I'm not with them either. We're talking about some, a third thing. We're going to escape this dichotomy. And so I feel like my greatest challenge is to try to find some way about, of talking about these things that escapes this false duality that, in my opinion, has narrowed the conversation and really narrowed it. So um, I want to be able to very clearly say I absolutely love the Internet. I've put a great deal of my life into helping to build it. Um, among other things, I was, uh, I was the chief scientist of the engineering office of Internet 2, which helped build out the, the, uh, the backbone and uh, supported the initial file copying and all sorts of stuff. I mean, like, I've actually worked on the thing. I'm actually, I've, I'm not just talk, I'm action. So I love the Internet. I love computers. I, I have a lot of fun with computers. And yet, I happen to think a lot of the particular designs on the surface of all this stuff, which are all pretty recent, just from the last 10 years, which includes a lot of the social networking stuff, and a lot of the crowdsource stuff, and a lot of the uh, recommendation engine stuff, and a lot of the wiki-ish stuff. I don't like this whole trend, and I think that they're, 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 it's mistaken in a lot of ways. Um, uh, I think it's lazy, anti-tech stuff, because it's much easier software to write than the stuff that should be written. So from a technologist's perspective, it's sort of it has a, a low quality feeling, it's sort of shoddy um, from my perspective. Um, so if I was just going to be, if I could give, I could give a geeky critique about what lazy computer science it is. I haven't been doing that here because it's not that department. But for anybody to perceive me to be criticizing the internet as a whole or technology or computation, somehow I haven't succeeded in breaking us out of this artificial and very narrow false opposition. Um, so, uh, what I, what I do believe is that the present designs um, are very short-sighted, that they give us, um, they trade our future for trinkets, more or less, that they give us 
a sort of an easy, somewhat lazy, somewhat shallow kind of reward when what we really need is something sustainable and long term, particularly the United States and particularly right now. Um, now, I've uh, another little challenge I'm facing is I've had to present my ideas something like eight times in the last <laughs> two days, and so I'm getting to the point where I different parts of my brain have announced that they might um, go on strike if I <laughs> repeat myself too many times. So I, I, um, um, I can try to give the, the, the briefest summary possible, which unfortunately is a little hard to do because the argument is somewhat complex. But very roughly speaking, um, there's a, a major question about how mankind can arrange its affairs that's been with us uh, at least since the rise of industrialization. And you can even find foreshadows of it from earlier in, in, in the history of thought if you want to look. But very clearly in the 19th century, there was this very simple question, which is, let's suppose technology gets really good. What's the role of humans then? It's a very simple question. And that question is very hard to answer. It's very hard to answer. And many have attempted. Uh, it was this question that motivated Marx, and his writing is all about it, and he has a particular answer, which I think is wrong, but I think along the way he actually had some very good ideas, very interesting ones. I just think his overall conclusion is quite wrong. Um, uh, another was the rise of a kind of literature called science fiction, and, uh, and it has a set of answers um, which I think have been mostly wrong, and I can go into that in some detail if you're interested. I have in the last couple of days for anybody who's heard me talk about that. Um, a third kind of answer was uh, Rousseau and this sort of rejection of modernity with an idea that uh, some sort of original natural state is more real and more true. That was expressed by many people and continues to be. I think that one's wrong. So what's right? So I think, um, I think uh, what's going on with the current internet uh, is bouncing around between those three wrong answers, reliving the mistakes of the 19th century. Um, I believe there's a fourth answer that was born in 1960 uh, with the initial concept of how the internet could be designed. Uh, the first person to articulate it was Ted Nelson. Um, and so far as I have been able to see, that fourth answer is the workable one. And this is the one that's not part of the conversation right now. Um, I think if somebody can really get it, can really see what it is and understand how it's different from what's going on, they can see forward to a way the internet could evolve and the way the uh, economic order could evolve to make, to, to have people be able to live proud lives with a lot of liberty and self-invention despite machines getting really good. And, and so it's that, it's that fourth possibility that I have been attempting to update and articulate. Now, that fourth possibility, um, because it's so alien to our current way of thinking, is a little hard to describe, and I have to approach it in different ways, but it's so simple once you see it. It's like, just try, I have to, to try to get this thing to pop into place is actually pretty hard, because we are constantly bombarded by all this rhetoric that there could be no such thing, but actually there it is. It's a possibility. So, um, the essential idea is that um, as machines get better, people ought to be able to earn a living from their hearts and brains. Because the alternative to that is to say that as the machines get better, everybody should, uh, the people who aren't needed will become peasants or, or uh, uh, will be forgotten and lost. Now, um, the, in, um, and I'm, 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 I'm going to write over a lot of examples here, but I think that's the normative feature right now. What we're doing is we're concentrating all the money and power around computers at certain privileged nodes in the center of the internet. Um, the most important of those are the finance-related the finance -related computers that are able to sort of spy on the whole economy by being in a privileged position and just pull money out of it in a way that is unproductive, and that's, uh, that's been done to credit, it's been done to real estate, it's been done to finance in general. And it's completely transformed the nature of finance and made it absurd. But the thing is that that type of computer, and by the way, it's been done by people who are friends that I still am have, you know, are still are my friends despite me, my, me saying this to them all the time. So I, I know a lot of the particular quants who, who program these things. 
Um, and then um, the mirror image of that sort of computer is Google or Facebook, which is in a privileged position and spies and everything and pulls money out of the system. And I think that the effect is similar, which is an impoverishment of, of the, the, the general population of people using it. Now, um, the, um, the, the reason this is important is that you need a middle class in order to have um, democracy, in order to have an uncorrupt polis, in order to have a working society that's sustainable. Um, we've seen that again and again, we've learned it again and again. And so if the information economy doesn't create a middle class within the information economy, um, then you will not, you will have a corruptible system, you will have a system that's kind of phony and is based on illusions and manipulation. The cloud has to be distributed in order for democracy to work well enough that people have the power to invent themselves. Uh, that's, I think, just the way the world works. Now, um, in the Ted Nelson idea, the fourth way I was talking about before, um, instead of the, we tend to sort of bounce back and forth between this dichotomy of two options, both of which I find to be unacceptable. All right, one of them is you have um, <coughs> uh, a few very powerful figures who serve as the gatekeepers between everybody else, and they dole out a little bit of money on the way, and that would be Apple or the studio system um, and so forth, or the publishers, my beloved Knopf and all that. Um, and a lot of people are uncomfortable with that, and there are problems with it. Um, the other option is everybody gives their stuff away for free between each other, but then there's a spying service, which might be the hedge fund computer or Google, that um, starts to earn money by, um, uh, well, actually, the particular way they do it is instructive. Let me, let me go over the Google or Facebook financial model. There's a... Um, <clears throat> a perverse incentive to undo the whole reason why we, many of us worked so hard on the internet for so many years. Um, what we've done now with the internet is we've created a world <clears throat> in which there's a <clears throat> artificial degree of, um, of um, disabling of the natural powers of the internet um, in order to create a commercial opportunity for re-enabling them. So let me explain what I mean by that. Um, when you, so many of the designs feature uh, recommendation engines where there's some program that makes a model of you and refines what you get when you do a search so that it's personalized for you, recommends movies, recommends music, recommends friends for you to meet, <laughs> etc. So um, the, the initial motivation was people interested in artificial intelligence and whatnot, but the com there's a perverse incentive that drives it commercially, which is that from the perspective of being on top of one of these privileged nodes, like the, face, the, the core of Facebook or Google, if you can um, lasso people in and kind of narrow what they're in contact with, then there's more commercial value that you can extract from people who want to reach those people because they're not going to find them naturally. So essentially, th there's been a perverse commercial incentive to, make, to, to have the Internet turn, prefer designs that... Um, pigeonhole people or collect them into these separated groups because that's where the business opportunity is. Then you get to perform an act of ambient blackmail where you can charge for connections that should have happened naturally. And that's what we've come to call advertising online. Um, if this sounds overly dark, I don't know. I, I, um, I, uh, I, I have to push it a little bit because I find that the, the, the present dogma is so strong that if I don't use pretty strong language, it's hard to cut through it. Um, <laughs> now, the um, um, I should say something else, too, just to be very clear. I'm, I'm part of this world. I sold a company to Google. I work with Microsoft now. I, these are all my friends, and I believe what I'm saying is in Silicon Valley's interest, because I believe that if clout and capital were distributed out among everybody, instead of just being concentrated, the whole thing would get so much more capitalized that we'd actually do better. I think we're thinking in a short-sighted a, a short manner, so I actually believe I'm speaking in my own commercial interest, just to let you know. There, this is not some altruistic, hippy-dippy, Marxist nonsense. I actually believe I'm promoting, um, I, I believe that if, the, if, the, if I happen to be right and the world happens to agree, Silicon Valley would, would become richer, not poorer as a result. So would Hollywood. So, so we, can, we can have a little California alliance about that. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> And so, um, the uh, uh, 
So anyway, so, so what this fourth way would involve is not <coughs> gatekeepers like Apple that have walled gardens of some, of some sort. It would not involve this, everybody can file share and mash up and wiki and stuff, but then the spy computer makes the money off of all of you. Instead, it would be a third way, which is different. And the third way is that every single person can easily and conveniently and realistically sell their stuff as they wish, if they want, or give it away. But they have, right now, they're, they're in, for practical purposes, they're precluded from that. You don't really have a way to sell your stuff online because it's, it's, um, it's too easy to pirate and it's too hard to make money off of iTunes Store. And the options are really sort of lottery-like. Um, but if there was a world where people could buy and sell from each other, what would suddenly pop into place would be a figure ground reversal about the social contract. And this is the thing that's a little hard to imagine. So. I'll try to give you the take on it that I've given students. Um, it might be hard to imagine, but there are a great many people in the world today and in the United States fairly recently, and tons of them on campus when I was your age, who believe that property is theft, to paraphrase a certain famous Marxist. And if you believe property is theft, then you believe that owning like your own, having your own apartment that other people can't just use when they want is somehow a bad thing, that everything should be open and that, that would be a better world and that all evil comes from this idea that you, you accumulate this property and you have all this, this private space and everything that's supposed to be a bad thing. Well, I don't know. You know, I, I, um, we, when, I was, when I was in school, there was this fad for communal houses and all that based on these ideals. And it, it wasn't pretty, let me just say. <laughs> it turns out to be pretty hard to do in practice because of just the way people are. And most of us ended up liking the idea that we could close the door to our room and nobody's going to go in there and mess up our stuff while we're gone. And once you have that experience and you realize, actually, it's kind of nice to have a space that other people don't intrude on, that you have a space you have some control <coughs> over, that there's something, then you're much more likely not to invade somebody else's space. So if I ask the question, why don't you go around breaking into people's houses, it's not fear of the police so much that keeps you out. That might play a role, but it's basically you buy into a social contract where you like living in a world in which you don't expect your house to be broken into. And so in exchange for that, you accept a sort of a constraint on your behavior that you don't tend to break into other people's houses. This is what in the ancient world was called the golden rule. Still, uh, and um, this sort of, this very simple idea, uh, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. So in a world in which other people actually, you had a reasonable chance at buying, at, at selling stuff to other people, you wouldn't view buying their stuff online as being this unfair burden, but rather supporting the same system that supports you. Just like we had a transformation of moving from these group households to actually having personal space again, because we realized that particular ideology wasn't working. So. I think something similar has to happen online. And of course, right now, um, there's a generation of young faculty who grew up with this ideology of everything wanting to be free. I helped articulate that ideology at first. I'm, I very much want to challenge young faculty to not make them saying the same mistake as the Marxist faculty when I was a student and become too entrenched with the particular ideas that were hip when they were young, but instead to challenge themselves um, so that's, a, that's, that's an active challenge to all of you who are on faculty. Um, and I especially want to challenge the students to think for yourself. If you find yourself agreeing with everything I say, stop and figure out what you disagree with. You need to invent yourself. But if you, if you find yourself buying into the official line of the, the wiki mashup, social network, blah, 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 really stop yourself. Because basically, you're becoming our pawn, we being Silicon Valley. Um, what, I mean, the thing, you, ha you have to understand the game we're playing. We, uh, I don't want you to just become our victim, you know, our sort of sheep that, that's following in the little grooves that we make up for you. Um, I want you to be proud, to find a way to make your own living, to become rich, and to buy stuff from us on that basis. I don't want to just be plucking little pennies off of you while we're all in a decline spiral. All right, so that's the basic thing. <laughs> <laughs> on that easy note, <laughs> um, what I'd like to do now is uh, call on Professor Dimitri Williams, who is really one of the leading thinkers in the uh, area of, of games and the relationship between what happens in the gaming world of cyberspace and what happens in the real world. And uh, Dimitri is an associate professor here at the school. 
recently promoted, we're uh, very proud to say. Um, and so I'm going to ask uh, Dimitri to uh, respond to uh, those interesting, provocative comments. Okay, thank you. Um, so interesting stuff. I had an opportunity to uh, interact with a uh, uh, with our guest a couple days ago, and I had lots of stuff I agreed with, lots of stuff I disagreed with. There were intellectual hand grenades being tossed left and right. I thought it was pretty entertaining. Um, I want to highlight uh, a cause for pessimism, a cause for optimism, and a cause where I think there might be a false duality going on even now, and, uh, and, and invite you to, uh, to respond. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I think maybe it would be appropriate to open up and have the audience jump in. I'm sure everybody's going to want to get in on this and other things. So um, on, the, on the somewhat pessimistic side, um, we had a guest in this room uh, on Monday, uh, Pablo Boschowski, who was here visiting and talking about the role of journalism and talking about some of these same forces of centralization and control. And one of the facts that I remember from his visit was that uh, when they were looking at all the content that was created, that only about, I think he said, 16% of it was original. Everything else was being repurposed. It's the same stuff repackaged. And so it echoed this, this idea that you know, you've got these central forces constantly pushing a smaller and smaller number of people to be in charge of something, which is a, a theme we're familiar with in almost every uh, debate we're in. Um, so that's, you know, that's a reason to be uh, kind of down about it. Um, on the other hand, I'm not sure that that is something that's going to last forever. And uh, uh, when it comes to the who's going to create these things and what the financial incentives for them are, I wonder if we might not ever reach some kind of consortium-like state where people actually are uh, empowered to write their own stories and they are rewarded um, based on how much interest their particular stuff generates. Um, some of the tension that I, that I had with some of Jaron's ideas was this idea that all must go through central servers and controls, whereas I see that there is some cause for backlash against such systems, that there are other forces that are happening even within Web 2.0 circles where um, people are being empowered. At the same time as people are being limited and controlled, they're also being given far more tools than they used to have. So I don't see this as all good news or all bad news, but it's a, a much more mixed bag. And the, uh, the, the point that, that I was thinking on most after we, after we spoke was about the idea of art and creativity, um, where I think I had a much more optimistic take on what's happening out there in the world. And this got us into notions of what's good art, what's high art, what's, what's lousy, you know, what's out there. And if you can correct me if I'm, if I'm paraphrasing this, this argument in, incorrectly, the sense I got was you were concerned that um, where the old structures are being swept aside and being replaced by these new ones with centralized servers, that there is less good quality stuff happening than there could be or should be. Whereas I felt much more optimistic that um, more people are empowered to be authors in more ways than ever had been before, and that although the art might not fit into some of the same categories we've always had, there's more stuff out there, more good stuff, more bad stuff, just more stuff. Stuff still, nonetheless, at risk of being captured and concentrated by industry and forces, but a tidal wave of so much stuff that it dwarfs what we've had before. And we were arguing about, is there any good on TV now compared to 20 years ago? There's more. I mean, the answer is always more. Same thing in music, same thing in writing, same thing in everything. So these same forces of concentration and consolidation and empowerment happening at the same time seems to me to be a tension that's ongoing rather than a foregone conclusion. Although I do heed the warning that it's something to always look out for. I think the point was also made well in Lessig's code book, a very similar dark kind of story of if we don't, if we're not more careful with the rules, we're going to get what we aren't, you know, what we don't want, we're not paying attention to. And then my last point is about the mixed bag of social technologies and what it's doing to us interpersonally and with communities. Um, something I read in this book seems to suggest that uh, it's bad, you know, it's, it's bad news and we're getting dumbed down, shallowed relationships. And I do empirical work on this and I can say it's absolutely true. I see lots of dumbed down, shallowed relationships. I've got scales which basically could be called dumb and shallow, right? And you, know, <laughs> you can see them happening. Um, at the same time, there are more relationships and they're more qualitatively different relationships than there were there before. Um, you get much more uh, diverse stuff happening before. I think of some of the websites and the communities my students have brought in in class, and there are a couple that kind of stand out to me as exemplars of the weirdness that's going out there. Um, there is a community that's all for um, people with long hair, like really, really long hair, like, like, like long, long hair. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, you know, to the floor long hair. And, you know, how cool is it that they have a community, whereas they couldn't have gotten together beforehand. I just, I just thought that was, that was really neat. 
there was another community for all um, vacuum enthusiasts, people really into vacuums. And it turns out that it's a really vibrant subculture for gay men who happen to gravitate towards interest around vacuum cleaners. I mean, I just couldn't make this stuff up, you know, but it's how to Let us prefer not to analyze that. <laughs> right. We do. That's why it's so fun. But these communities are, you know, they're at risk of being captured and commoditized. At the same time, they're also coming up of their own, you know, creativity. It's the same commerce trend that's going on there, the same tension, but I guess I see it as a much more mixed bag that the ending hasn't been written quite as much. Um, that's enough brain dump to toss out there. I, just, I think it's much more nuanced, and I, I kind of return to your opening point about false dichotomies. I don't want to get caught into the, it's all bad and commerce is always going to ruin it, and we have no power. So um, I'll, I'll respond to your third thing first, your second thing, and, a, a, and I'm, I, after that I'm going to ask you to restate the first one, which I didn't understand. Uh, but I don't want to do that now because I'll forget the stuff. Um, so the third one, um, let's see, the third one was about finding people that you wouldn't have found in community and all that. And um, there's a little <coughs> game we play, which is to make the world, I call this artificial mysteriousness, where we make the world seem more inaccessible and mysterious than it really is in order to justify the value of the services that it bring it to you. So, for instance, the interesting thing about Netflix is that the database of available titles is rather small and would be easily browsable, so the recommendation engine is, is almost functionless. And yet there's this sort of fetishization of it and these contests for optimizing it and all. But the truth is that the number of titles isn't small enough to, to, to create a problem in the first place. Like 50,000, something like that? Yeah, that's, if it was a billion, that would be different. But the thing is, uh, 50,000 is browsable. I mean, that's not a big deal. Uh, that's, I mean, that's like the number, the files you have on your computer or something. It's not, it's not like, it's not like you don't have to Google the whole internet, you know, to to, to deal with that number. So it's it's an artificial problem, in my view. And having built a lot of browsers for different different magnitudes of stuff, um, and so. Uh, which is, not, I mean, I actually like Netflix. I think I think it's a cool company, and I, I want them to succeed. But I just want to point out that there's a little bit of a conceit there, or, or sort of a, a trick being played, and that's common in media. You know, like without tricks being played, we wouldn't have the entertainment industry. So, more power to them. But <laughs> since this is a school, just between you and me, that's what's going on. And so, um, uh, another example came up where. Um, I was at one of the classes on Monday, a music class, and I, asked, I was asking the students about musicians that they really care about. And this, uh, this one person said, oh, here's this really obscure, unusual person that you couldn't possibly have found without the internet. It happened to be somebody that um, I'd known for many years because we were both weirdo musicians and we found each other on that basis before there was an internet. Um, and what I realized is that actually, you know, in the world before the internet, people were finding each other. Like, there's, there's, this, there's this sort of... Um, there's a bit of an artificiality to the problem that needs to be solved here. Um, finding people with long hair is not hard because it's, you know, um, I do agree that there are some things on the internet, uh, there's some examples that are, are fresh and, um, and some of them are very touching and very important. I think people with unusual medical conditions finding each other is a really important example um, and I could, I could tell you many others. So I'm not saying that it never happens. All I'm saying is that there's a bit of an exaggerated sense of um, I mean, it's not as if everybody was in like this sort of, uh, you know, insular bubble before the internet and trapped in this little, you know, it wasn't like that actually. Um, so there, it's just important to understand that there's a mythology around these services that's arisen to sell them that exaggerates some of these points. And among us, if we're professionals, we should learn to see through that and not be too, too uh, beholden to them. All right, then your second point was about quality. And one of the first things I want to say about that is that uh, I would like to see that question separated from my main argument, which I presented before, because it doesn't depend on it. Um, it what, whether the stuff is good or not is kind of independent from the question of the uh, socioeconomic future of the species. Um, I would like to see all art be as good as possible. <laughs> But, you know, there's, there's also this funny thing that all children can't be above average and all that sort of stuff. You know, like, there's, there's a, you know, I don't know. Uh, and it's also, my main point isn't to go around judging whether other people are doing good communication or good art or something. I, I'm, it's, that's not my role. And I, um, uh, there are a couple of specific ways that I do think there has been a degradation of quality under the current way of doing things. 
but I present those as sort of separate points and sort of ancillary arguments, and I, I think if they fall, it doesn't, have, it doesn't affect my main argument. But I'll present a couple of those cases again, just, just for the hell of it. Um, one of them is that if, um, if you remove clout from all of the people spread out and you don't have a middle class with its own clout and power, you don't have labor unions, say, and all that, and, and all the money and the power accumulates in the center, it screws up your politics, and you really can't sustain a democracy on that basis. And my interpretation of a recent event is that we're seeing that happen in the online world. And when I talked about this, somebody accused me of just using an anecdote, and I can agree with that. I don't know if we have enough cases to really confirm a trend here, but nonetheless, that's how I see it. So the particular thing I'm thinking of is the expose about the Koch brothers from a few weeks ago that appeared in The New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And so for those of you who don't know about this, it turns out there's a couple of brothers who are billionaires named Koch, and they, uh, they um, found that they could uh, go around to people who blogged and tweeted and pay them a little bit of money and um, <clears throat> steer them uh, through monetary feedback into being more right-wing nutty and Tea Party-ish, which is the, what they wanted. And they were able to create this illusion of a grassroots, grassroots emergent blogosphere, Twitterverse thing that was actually centrally funded and with not that much money. And the thing is that if you have an impoverished polis with a lot of money in the center, it becomes bribable. And you can start to even, and this is not to impute every single person in it, obviously, but it's just as a matter of fact, at some point it starts to fail. You need to have a middle class to have a robust political life that isn't totally corrupted by the people with the most money. Um, you need to have some power, some clout that's distributed in order to have democracy. And so, um, and then furthermore, not only was the, the, not only did it turn out to be a pretty low price tag to corrupt the blogosphere and the Twitterverse in this particular case, it also turned out that it didn't self-discover. There, I, no bloggers uncovered this or reported it. It was a traditional reporter working for a traditional magazine on paper, getting paid to take enough time to research it, doing, instead of just a few tweets, like this long, very careful article. And, and so the traditional thing, which I'm not saying is perfect, but it was able to uncover this when the new thing wasn't. Now you can say it's only one case, it's a pretty big deal. I mean, think about this election coming up and what it means and how much this has had an effect on it. So it's a very important case. Um, is it exceptional or the norm? I don't know, but I do think it, it's illustrative of a certain um, <coughs> danger in doing things the way we're doing it. Um, and uh, there's some other examples related to music in the book, which I won't, I won't belabor here. So I do think there's some issues related to quality that come up. Um, the thing that I am not saying is that any, any particular person working within the system is automatically an idiot or a worse artist or something like that or corrupt. Um, any more than I would say that about citizens of, of some country that's lost its middle class. Um, it's, it's not your fault. You, you know, your politicians aren't entirely your fault. Uh, you know, and um, you, you, uh, I, uh, I do, so, and, and one of the things that sort of um, frustrates me about this particular argument is that um, uh, one of the aspects of the general argument that often comes up is the validity of um, emergent large-scale social effects and with wisdom of crowds and all of this. And I've argued that wisdom of crowds effects are real but limited and only exist in certain cases. And, um, and others perceive them to be um, valid in more cases than I do. So there's a dispute there. But this issue about the strong middle class correlating with working democracy is exactly an example of one of the cases where an emergent social effect is real and I think repeatedly demonstrable. And I'm, so I'm actually appealing to a sort of a crowd effect thing to people who normally tell me I don't believe in crowd effect things enough. <laughs> and, but this one is, is for real and we should take it seriously. Take a shot chat and open it up. Or? Deal. What? Uh, I'll make a couple comments and then I think we 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 we, we, okay. we I still I didn't understand your first point of the three I have to say. Um, but you can either I'll leave it to you. But I, I just simply didn't get it. Uh, it was about um, the specific specific example of um, authorship in journalism and whether the long term trend the short term trend if there's reason for optimism or pessimism based on structural forces based on what is now what's happening and what might be as technology continues to play a role mm. That's well um, 
I view myself as uh, a deep optimist in the sense that I believe that there are enough people with enough to contribute that an a information economy can support a middle class. And that's a profoundly optimistic point of view because it means that I believe that something like half the people have enough to say that other people would be willing to pay for it. And so I'm deeply optimistic about human potential and uh, the future of authorship. Okay. Um, a couple small points to film within, I think, uh, the Dean will steer the ship. Um, this idea of uh, pre-internet and post-internet in communities, mm -hmm. I think the evidence actually suggests that there is an insular bubble um, and that uh, indicators of the extent to which we connect with each other through communities and uh, some of this is nothing to do with technology, some of this is a lot to do with suburbs and cars and positioning and concentration and, uh, you know, That's not technology. urban design stuff. Um, well, not with, flashing, <laughs> not with flashing lights and routers, of course. But okay. no, of course, it is to some extent. Um, but I, I think that there really are some strong social trends and forces um, mm -hmm. that there have been people becoming more atomized and more taken away from each other. Mm -hmm. And one of the tough things for me to reconcile with the material is the sense that um, there hasn't been some improvement due to these technologies, some of which capture us and some of which don't. And that I think there's much more of a dialogue going on on all these levels where people are being empowered at the same time as they're captured. So, it's so can, a, it's can a, I try to paraphrase you? Sort of like people were separated by the suburbs, but then social networking got them back together. Is that approximately what you're saying? Uh, it, it showed them where they all were, and then they could do something. Yeah. Some um, things happened they were good, and some things were I, bad. What I say in the book is that in my own, in my own work looking into this, um, I found that it's, I find that it's a, the age demographic is very important in determining this, and in fact, um, Facebook and other social networking, if you, want, if you want to look for beneficial effects, you find them more and more in older demographics and less and less in younger ones. So that's, that's my observation, and I could go into that in some detail, and of course it depends what criteria you use. We don't find this. Okay. Well, I, I suspect we're looking at somewhat different criteria. Could be. Yeah. I'm going to invite uh, some digital natives. <coughs> <laughs> ask questions. So, uh, <laughs> that the will they will they dance in grass dresses for us? <laughs> <Absolutely. laughs> <laughs> Only if we don't do that <laughs> as the immigrant. So I'm going to actually privilege uh, students to ask questions right through here. And please identify yourself, Mr. Student. Um, I'm Matt Burrells. I'm a student, but not a. Uh, not in a formal academic program. Um, my question is, you spoke a lot about the middle class, and um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the digital divide, and specifically in your, let's call it your, your fourth platform, where people can live off their hearts and minds mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, does that necessarily always exclude the lower class? Will they always be excluded? No, benefits? I, well see, what's happening right now is we have these two designs that reinforce each other. And one of them is the Pirate Bay world of file co sharing and all that, which is um, um, very much supportive of the spying model of the internet that, that, that uh, Google and Facebook run because the less, the more things are copied and mashed up, the less provenance there is and the more difficult it is to understand anything so the more value there is, you know, in the search engine or the social networking that provides you a framework to contextualize things again so they mean something. It's a very bizarre scheme and I could go into that in more detail but anyway, so you have the Pirate Bay sort of thing and file copying and all the, I could mention many other designs and then that, um, of course you can't make money on content in that world. I mean you should talk to people trying to develop Android apps and they're like, it, it's it, it's sort of rough. So then, so then you say, oh okay, oh iTunes Store. So now, um, the, so the, the, this other, the polar opposite that's created by that is this incredibly closed world, this, this walled garden. And uh, in that world, it's still hard to make money, but it's possible. You first have to pass through a censorship barrier because that's controlled by the central thing. And it's basically a recreation of the old world within the new by using an ex, uh, this gadget. Um, I have to say, um, there are many arguments against both of these things. I, th these are the two things that I don't like, and the third thing I'm proposing would be that everyone would automatically be able to buy and sell online universally without having to set up a new store. 
Um, now, the, the automatic universal account is absolutely crucial because for many reasons. One is just the cognitive load of maintaining passwords for 30,000 sites would be impossible and maintaining security on it, it just can't happen. So there can only be a small number of feasible accounts you can maintain in the world. You can do Netflix and Amazon and Apple or something, but you can't do 30,000 of them. So, um, so uh, and that's a ridiculous, like that, that, that fact of human cognition is not a good basis for <laughs> Uh, for limiting the economy, what there should be is one single thing, just like in the real world like if you if you could only have a, a Walmart dollar that wouldn 't work at at target, that would not be a real economy. You have to have a single currency that works everywhere, then you can have a market and so the, the, so what I would like to see is a system where um, any account is accepted by any other account it 's universal and, and, and it, this horrible specter of this awful thing called government would be sort of invoked because it would be a universal um, right to basically buy and sell. And I believe in that world, you'd escape this dichotomy we have right now, where basically we have walled gardens for the rich and chaos for the poor. Um, so that, that's approximately the world that we're creating right now. And um, the walled gardens for the rich are, I mean, it's great for Silicon Valley that it's working. You know, it's, it's great. And, and, and um, we have a brilliant, brilliant salesperson in, in Steve Jobs. And um, you know, it's, it's great, it's great. But the thing is, it's definitely elitist, you know, because it, 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 uh, it, it, it creates this premium just to support this, this center of control that it is not, does not filter out to all the content producers, certainly, only a tiny number of them, like on a lottery-like basis, um, meaning that very few really can, can benefit enough to sustain themselves from it. But uh, it, it, it requires such a, such a premium, it requires overpricing the devices relative to what they could be in a more open competitive market that it's inher inherently elitist. And uh, so, now, that said, I want, I want to say something that's extremely important, which is I'm an empiricist. So if you talked to me 30 years ago, you would have heard a utopian vision that's similar to the one I'm criticizing now. And what changed for me was seeing results. It's not that in the abstract I started to sort of filter through and think through my ideology. It's that I looked out at the world at what's happening and I'm seeing people poorer than they used to be and I'm saying this isn't working. And so you have to, you have to be able to say what some people said about, you know, uh, uh, what people saw in, in Marxism sometimes when it was actually tried, and you say it's not working, and that's a reason to change your ideas. So if the thing I'm proposing is tried and it doesn't work, then that's, that would be an excellent reason to reject it. I think it's wonderful to drive forward with new ideas, to try new things, but it's absolutely essential to be honest about looking at the results. So my hypothesis is that the thing I'm proposing would result in less digital divide. If that didn't turn out to be the case, then I would have been wrong. <laughs> you know, it's just like it's that simple. Yeah. yeah. Other, other, I'm gonna get stu uh, under, other undergraduate students here <clears throat> moving from undergrad, sophomore, junior. Yes, sir. Hi, my name's Kamal. Hey. Uh, I'm an undergrad. Um, you were talking about uh, kind of these decentralized power centers within the internet, and I'm just wondering how we might might be able to address something like that through education with how it works maybe at the, even as young as the primary, you know, middle school level, how could we use education to combat that and try to kind of create more demanding consumers on the internet? Well, it's a great question. The most important thing, the thing of overwhelming imp importance is that people be as aware as possible and as conscientious and conscious as possible about what they're doing online rather than accepting the lazy grooves that are presented to them by particular software or services or hardware designs. Um, you should, and so the, the, what I really am hoping is that people will, will look skeptically at everything that's offered to them. Just as with, like when you read a book or if you listen to me talk, I'm hoping what's going on is you're saying to yourself, do I agree with this guy or not? And hey, I agree with that, I disagree with that, and you're really thinking, that's what I hope is going on. I hope you're not sort of thinking, well, I have to like it as a whole or not. I hope that you're not thinking, um, I better like it, I'm supposed to, or I better not like it because that would be cool. I'm hoping you're really trying to work at it and think and invent yourself in the process. But exactly that same process is what should happen every time you look at whatever latest 
silly change there is to Facebook. My understanding is that yesterday there's a new thing where a sign comes up saying, oh, your friends have more friends than you do, so why aren't you, you know, pushing harder, you know, like, you know, oh, be insecure, you know, like, you get, twist the knife. And so what you should do, when you look at that stuff, you should look at that and you say, what a load of crap. You should be able to, you should have the power within yourself to look at that and step back from it and not be manipulated and think, okay, I'm going to use, I'm either going to use this on my own terms or I'm not going to use it. I'm going to make decisions. Um, and the same thing about the design of something from Apple or anybody else. Uh, you have to be a little tough, a little skeptical. And if you do that, then you have a shot of instead of just being a customer within the context of whatever, whatever Silicon Valley scheme is popular at the moment, to really be running your own life and, and, and build a career out of it and build yourself, even more importantly. Um, and I, if there's, I don't know exactly how to educate for that kind of independence and toughness, but I think that that's the most essential character I want to try to inspire in you guys. Okay, let, let me just uh, ask this question, and then I'm going to come to the back here. Um, are you saying that because when this new technology was sort of being born, you happened to be present at the creation? Well, not and it, every. It, it may have been easier at that particular moment in time before a lock-in occurred to be able to push back and redesign and come there, up there with new things. And now it's more locked. Yeah, in. now it's harder. Now it's going to be a, a much much harder course to, to see the thing evolve because there's this lock-in thing that happens. I really regret, for instance, when the campus Maoists would would rush Ted Nelson and, and knock him off the stage or promote this sort of open stuff that I didn't fight back more. That was in the order of 30 years ago. I really regret that I didn't argue more with Richard Stallman about going to China and making, you know, learning from the Chinese Communist Party as it was at that time about how to do a free software movement. I, I should have, I don't know. I really regret uh, a, a lot of, there were a lot of moments that where, where I might have been, I don't know really. But I do feel, and, and I could say that about many other people too, I, I do feel that we kind of, we had all these conversations and we're pretty aware of the options, but then we were kind of a little lazy and like let this thing happen. And in particular, um, I don't know, the, the thing, the turn of the century is when it really changed. Because the whole thing. Is it tougher now? I mean, the young man asked the question, and, yeah. and you talk in your book about lock in, and let's say for the sake of argument, if you happen to be lucky enough to be there when this new thing is being designed and and, and, and constructed and rolled out, then your leverage is greater. But if you come along now and you're 19 years old and there are 20 or 30 years of sort of, you use this software, you use this hardware, then maybe it's tougher. But that's just, again, a, a question to you. Maybe, well, yeah. maybe it's just as easy now to take those radical steps or those reinventive steps, innovative steps, than it was. But. Well, sure. I mean, there's a funny... There's sort of a mix of challenges here because some of it is very real. Like if you're living your life through Facebook and then you decide, you know, I don't like this and you want to quit, it's very, very, very hard. I mean, it's a, it's a huge challenge and you really pay a price. And um, I, if you've only grown up with Facebook and you never experienced a world without it, it might make it harder. And that latter part is, an, is a problem of imagination rather than practicality. And the problem of imagination is one you, have the, you can overcome. The problem of practicality just takes work, period. Good point. Yes, sir, and then, and then here. I just wanted to mention, it seems to me that non-programmers will always be at least one major step behind. So I, I want to see what your take is on folks, this, this may be a new class of, of people who understand yeah. the architecture of the Internet as opposed to everybody. Oh, I know, it's so true. Like, Facebook privacy settings are sort of like this uh, way of, like, sticking it to people who can't code. Because basically, if you're a programmer, you can control them, and if you're not, you have no hope. And so it is this sort of uh, power to the geeks thing. And um, I don't think it's, like, precisely deliberate, but I think it does come out of the character of our geek culture where we, we do really think we're smarter than other people. <laughs> and, and there is this kind of, like, oh, if you can't code, you're not... You know, I code, therefore I am, sort of a thing. And, um, and uh, I, um, it's a problem. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really interesting, if you look at the history of user interface design, um, there's been this, the pendulum swings back and forth on this stuff. So um, there, uh, there was a wave of trying to make computers usable, which is the one we still benefit from, which started with Xerox PARC and uh, continued with the release of the Mac and Windows and uh, this sort of computer as we know it. 
and the iPad and all comes out of this one stream of people who worked very, very hard to promote this idea that computers should actually be usable by non-geeky types. And there was incredible resistance. There was like this unbelievable backlash from geeky people saying, oh, no, that's not serious. That's not serious. It's like, that's just a bunch of nonsense if you like something with Windows and a mouse and something you can touch and all that. that and so we've kind of gotten to the point where that's considered okay. But in the online world, the geeky thing is back. And so now, like, typing into the Google uh, search thing is like the old command line. And you're, you're, you, uh, you, you, you uh, set all these settings on Facebook without really knowing exactly what they mean unless you can really internalize this pretty complex logical structure in your head. So in the, in the Internet world, we're back to, we're back to this idea that um, a lack of usability is actually sort of glorious because it, it emphasizes the power of geekiness. And um, uh, I... To, to, in a funny way, I think there's a very strong coherence between a potential for a movement to try to make the internet have this kind of transparent, usable quality that we work so hard to, to give to personal computers and devices. Um, I think that's very compatible with this, the, the rest of the things I'm, I'm promoting here because that, that would undermine a lot of the artificial mysteriousness that makes the current way of doing things possible. Um, so for instance, um, 50,000 movies should be easy to browse through. Uh, and uh, like you have 50,000 files on your computer all the time and you can browse through those. You don't need a recommendation engine to find your own files, right? And uh, so we know that's doable, but online it's considered cool to have this recommendation thing because somehow it's like such a mysterious problem. And so um, if, if we could bring that same, that same idea that happened at Xerox Park and led to the, the sort of mac -y type or iPad-y type of experience that you're used to for a personal device to the internet, it would inherently shift the whole business structure of it in the direction I'm talking about. I mean, there's a question here, and then here, and then here. One, two, three. One, two, three. So, two things. And, and one, identify yourself. And, and, and be quick. I mean, sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. 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 Concept of that you either live off the grid or on the grid, and I wonder if it's a little more of a, of a duality between like sometimes you opt in and sometimes you opt out, and that it's not that you're necessarily you either you don't care, you're not knowledgeable about one or the other. But for some things, for Facebook, you might be totally cool. I'll let them do stuff. When it comes to Foursquare, I have all these rules. So that sometimes they're conditional, <laughs> um, and then also how your theory relates to net neutrality and the dynamic. Okay. Well, I'll address the two of them. Um, I completely agree with you that, um, let, let's say, if somebody, if somebody told me, um, oh, I listened to you, and so I quit Facebook, and I quit everything, and I'm going cold turkey, and I'm, I, I, uh, I put my iPhone in a blender, and I'm, I'm, uh, I would say, no, 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 you don't get it. The point is for you to be conscious and to be in control. So I would very much agree with you. But then that said, the current model in which you, the user, don't have any clout because you don't have money in the situation, so therefore you're so, somewhat beholden, um, it puts you in a position where, change, where Facebook can change the rules out from under you and does regularly and very deliberately. So you might think you've made a certain decision about how to use Facebook, but then they've changed your decision for you by changing the privacy rules or all sorts of other things. And so the thing is, because that's a moving target and a very complex one that only com programmers can understand, your powers are limited by the amount of work you can put into understanding your powers and the amount of work is so great that a lot of people simply can't put it forward. So there is a practical problem now, but in my mind that arises directly out of the fact that you don't have any clout because they have all the money and you don't in the online universe. And, and you know, just if you did have the clout and they needed your money, they'd be a lot nicer to you. But this way, this way, the, their real customer is the third party who's paying to get access to you and you're just the, you're the product, not the, not the customer. And so um, being, being the product gives you no power, and so they just keep on changing it. So in, in, in my, the world I pr propose, you'd be the customer, not the product. Um, you know, and then, that, then you'd have some influence and some power. Um, and then uh, the other thing you asked about, what you asked about? Net neutrality. Oh, net neutrality. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, okay. Um, if, you take, if, you, if you take all the money, if there's no middle class, you take the money away from everybody because everybody's file sharing and they're doing it for reputation stuff, and then you have this huge amount of money in the center, um, you will get corruption. And, oh, guess what? All the money went to Google, and suddenly Google wants to make an alliance with some provider. How could they possibly do that? Well, duh. You know, I mean, if you want net neutrality, you need a middle class. Just like any kind of neutrality in any society, you will not get it without that in the long term. So... Um, 
Net neutrality is a great principle. The only way to get it is not with abstract arguments, but by actually having clout distributed to people. So if users have clout, then there'll be net neutrality in the long term. If users don't have clout, there won't be. So if you're all passive sheep just being aggregated and advertised at, forget it. Net neutrality is a joke. It won't happen in the long term. So it's, it's the wrong battle as the first battle. It's certainly a desirable outcome. Yes. Uh, uh, here and then here. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say you would agree um, with the fact that we're moving towards a more fragmented, socially fragmented, and more um, isolated society where the individual is becoming more isolated. Um, so I was wondering if you think that these new technologies that have emerged are a cause or an effect of this fragmentation? Oh, the cause versus effect problem. Yeah, that's usually left to God to resolve. Uh, yeah, it's a really good question, you know. Um, cause and effect can often be tricky. Um, I, here's what I'd suggest. Um, there's often an ambiguity about that. And um, I, I generally argue that you might as well assume that the thing you can change is the thing that will matter just in case that turns out to be right. So um, if, if changing internet architecture helps, that as hard as that is because of the lock-in problems, it's certainly easier than changing society. You know? And um, I mean, that, uh, Facebook changes society all the time by changing architecture. Um, so apparently that's, an, easy, that's a, an easier access point. So cause and effect is very hard to untangle. Um, in terms of thinking about what hypothesis to work with that might give us a form of, of something to do that might work um, is probably useful to at least consider the idea that the tech is the cause. I'm sure that that's an oversimplification at the very least. Um, so, so sort of on a provisional basis, I'd suggest that we blame the particular net design, not the internet, you know, in, in some more basic way, uh, just because that gives us a pragmatic way to, to think of something to do. Yeah. Um, well, I think your book is really helpful to, you know, people studying communication and journalism and all kinds of uh, creative arts. But I was one. But you also make a lot of important points about the impact of AI on financial markets and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. so, with with what we have now in terms of financial derivatives, that kind of thing, do you think the horse is out of the barn on that, or do you think well, there's an effective way to I, I have regulate a, that? I've had, an, um, I've had on occasion a bit of a privileged position in seeing how some of these algorithms at the center of the powerful nodes work. And they ain't much. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at these financial computers, like the hedge fund computers and whatnot, the algorithms are just that much, and it's the, the positioning of the computer and its, its ability to get data is that much, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit like the Netflix thing, where the, the, the recommendation engine is a bit of a gimmick. Um, and there's, a, there's the AI aspect of some of these things. I'm not saying there's nothing there, but it's not the main thing. The main thing is the privileged position for getting yeah. data and, and using it. Uh, same thing for Google and Facebook. The algorithms is not. It's really the. It's really the the uh, positional advantage. But in terms of the destructive impact of some of those instruments. Yeah. Do you think there's a way to? Well, oh yeah. Like I mean, well, listen. To, the only uh, question is how much destruction happens before it's changed, right? And uh, this last round wasn't enough, obviously. So something worse has to happen, and then it'll change. <laughs> I mean, you know, just to be blunt. So yeah. a couple of uh, kind of program announcements. Our time is drawing to a close here. Um, I'm tempted to say, in the spirit of your earlier conversation, steal this book, but <laughs> that, that, that wouldn't be cool at all. So I believe it's for sale outside these doors, uh, oh, really? posted by the yes. bookstore. And if you're oh. nice, maybe you could ask our guest to sign a copy for you if he's willing. It's, that's, that's negotiable, perhaps. And also, I've been asked to um, point out um, uh, that uh, this will be uploaded and it will be on YouTube by 5 o'clock tomorrow. So if you guys would join me in thanking uh, Jaron for coming and spending time with us. And also a thank you to our own Dimitri Williams for uh, joining us.